In 1880, there are 38 states and 50 million people, most of whom live on farms or in rural communities. However, with new waves of immigration from Europe, the population begins to shift from rural to urban. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless tempest tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. For millions of immigrants, the Statue of Liberty, a gift of friendship from France, is a bright symbol of hope a promise of a better life in a land where freedom and justice reign. At the dedication ceremony in 1886, President Grover Cleveland promises, we will not forget that liberty has here made her home, nor shall her chosen altar be neglected. Yet for most immigrants, the better life is not immediate. Literally dumped on lower Manhattan Island, they pile on top of each other in teeming tenement districts. In some places, more than half a million people to the square mile. America, however, is the land of opportunity. The popular books of Horatio Alger tell how poor young men become astoundingly wealthy, and there are living examples. Alexander Graham Bell was a school teacher before he invented the telephone. Andrew Carnegie, a bobbin boy in a cotton factory. During his lifetime, he gives away $350 million. John D. Rockefeller, whose Standard Oil Company controls 90% of the nation's oil business, began as a bookkeeper. Another factor that enhances bank accounts is the absence of any personal income tax. In the 1880s, Americans not only can go from poor to rich in a hurry, they can travel from coast to coast in the record time of seven days. By 1890, four railroads have spanned the continent. And to make railroad time schedules less complicated, the nation is divided into four separate time zones. In the eastern time zone, a spectacular cog railway carries passengers to the 6,000-foot summit of New Hampshire's Mount Washington. Sitting squarely in the path of three major storm systems, New England's highest peak has some of the most devastating weather on the continent. P.T. Barnum calls it the second greatest show on Earth. In the mountain time zone, narrow gauge steam trains snake their way through valleys and over mountaintops, right into the heart of the Rocky Mountains. Throughout the Rockies, from the territory of Montana to the territory of New Mexico, miners are tearing into hillsides hoping to find the glory hole that will transform a life of labor into a life of ease. In Leadville, Colorado, storekeeper Horace Tabor parlays a small grub stake into a fabulous fortune. Earnings from his matchless mine give Tabor the title Silver King. In 1883, he grabs headlines by divorcing his wife and marrying a wide-eyed beauty called Baby Doe. The wedding takes place in Washington, D.C., a lavish affair attended by the president and congressman. After 10 years, the matchless plays out, and so does Tabor's health. On his deathbed, he tells Baby Doe, hang on to the matchless. She does, and 40 years later, she dies there in extreme poverty. In southwestern Colorado, another treasure is uncovered. 
the magnificent ruins of Mesa Verde. Sometime during the 13th century, Indian cliff dwellers built these remarkable stone cities. After living there for about a hundred years, they mysteriously abandoned them. May 24th, 1883. New York's biggest celebration since the opening of the Erie Canal. After 14 years of construction, the Brooklyn Bridge connects two of America's largest cities, Brooklyn and New York. Billed as the eighth wonder of the world, this gigantic suspension bridge features a wide promenade in the center for bicycling and strolling. The mayor of Brooklyn writes, no one who has ever been upon it can ever forget it. No one shall see it and not be prouder to be a human being. Two years later, in 1885, a monument to the memory of America's first president is finally completed. Fifteen years to plan, nearly 40 years to build. This austere obelisk is applauded as a fitting tribute to the soldier statesman who was first in war, first in peace, and first in the hearts of his countrymen. Twenty presidents later, and after only five months in office, James Garfield is fatally shot by a disgruntled office seeker who claims he wasn't given a promised public office. A New York Tribune headline reads, Killed by the Spoil System. After Vice President Chester Arthur takes office, he strongly supports the Pendleton Act, which calls for appointments to be made not by the political party in power, but by the newly created civil service system. Elected in 1884, Grover Cleveland is the first Democratic president since before the Civil War. Cleveland's administration is baffled by an unusual problem. What is to be done with the huge surplus of money in the national treasury? The president tries to get the high tariff on imports lowered, but the Republican Congress balks. Both agree to reduce postage rates from three to two cents. While in office, the 49-year-old bachelor marries Frances Folsom. At 21, she is the youngest first lady to occupy the White House. For their honeymoon, they go where every self-respecting couple who can afford it goes, Niagara Falls. In the election of 88, Cleveland wins the popular vote, but Benjamin Harrison gets more electoral votes and becomes president. Although women are permitted to vote in some state elections, only men have the right to vote in national elections. Despite efforts by social reformers such as Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, women's voting rights are 30 years away. In 1889, President Harrison makes an official proclamation. At 12 noon, April 22nd, certain Indian lands will be open to white settlement. Thousands of boomers rush to Oklahoma Territory. Those who jump the starting gun to file claims are called Sooners. For Indian nations, it is one more phase of resettlement or perhaps banishment. During the 1880s, final resistance to white expansion is crushed. In 81, Sitting Bull, the revered Sioux medicine man, surrenders. In 86, Geronimo, the elusive Apache, is captured. 
Their land is gone, and so is the one animal they depend upon for survival. Back in 1869, a Kansas Pacific train waited eight hours for a buffalo herd to pass. Now, unrestricted slaughter has brought them to near extinction. As buffalo disappear, the open range is filled with Texas longhorns. The great cattle drives from Texas to the rip-roaring railhead towns of Kansas, Abilene, Ellsworth, Wichita, Dodge City. However, by the late 1880s, more and more grassland is being turned upside down. Prairie cow towns are becoming somewhat respectable. Cattle barons are fencing off large permanent ranches, and the legendary cowboy is more often than not a hired hand who mends fences. Even Buffalo Bill has quit the frontier to sell the Old West to city slickers. And with railroads crossing and crisscrossing the nation, Wild West shows heading east past circus trains going west. Stage plays, operas, Chautauqua lectures, vaudeville acts are touring the country. And Broadway personalities, opera stars, and stump speakers are becoming household names. Edwin Booth, Lillian Russell, Sarah Bernhardt, Lily Langtree, William Jennings Bryan. HMS Pinafore. The Mikado. Operettas by Gilbert and Sullivan play to packed houses, whether on Broadway or in Muncie, Indiana. New York City, the Metropolitan Opera opens a new season with a new building, a full city block square. <laughs> Yet for most Americans in the 80s, entertainment is homegrown. Nearly every small town has at least one band. And the rousing tunes of John Philip Sousa elevate brass concert music to a new level. A favorite pastime is gathering in the parlor to sing old tunes and hits of the day. Sentimental ballads like Poverty's Tears Ebb and Flow or send me a rose from my angel mother's grave. Ben-Hur by General Lew Wallace is the best-selling novel of the decade. And Mark Twain, writing from his elegant home in Hartford, Connecticut, completes Life on the Mississippi, a Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's court, and his masterpiece, The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. In 1888, baseball's immortal poem, Casey at the Bat, is written by a San Francisco newspaper columnist. Baseball, during the 80s, undergoes significant change. In 84, pitchers, for the first time, are allowed to throw overhand. Catchers move up behind the plate instead of catching the ball on one bounce. Although the catcher's mitt is the first glove to be worn, only sissies use it. We use no mattress on our hands, no cage upon our face. We stand right up and catch the ball with courage 
and with grace. Uncivilized, disgusting, football is considered a game for brutes and barbarians. contest resembles the English sport of rugby until Walter Camp introduces a series of rules that includes a stationary line of scrimmage and a center snap to the quarterback. Like baseball, football is sparse on equipment. Players do not wear pads or helmets. In football, there are no coaches and no professional teams, and the game is still true to its name. Field goals, usually done by drop kicking, count more than touchdowns. As for basketball, it will not be invented until 1891. After vacationing in Scotland, George Fox returns to the rolling hills of western Pennsylvania and builds one of America's first golf courses on his country estate. Chartered in 1887, the nine-hole Foxburg Golf Club is the oldest course in continuous use in the United States. Golf, in its early stages, is primarily a sport for the wealthy, even though quart tomato cans are used for cups and well-oiled burlap bags smooth over sand greens. I can lick any man in the house. Boston strong boy John L. Sullivan backs up his haughty challenge in and out of the ring. Voted athlete of the decade, Sullivan defeats Jake Kilrain in 1889 for the Bare Knuckle Championship. It is the last major fight where contestants do not wear padded gloves. If Sullivan is king of sports, then Thomas Edison is the reigning emperor of science. His two recent inventions, the phonograph and the electric light bulb, have shaken the scientific world. In a very short time, they will conquer the rest of the world. However, when asked about his accomplishments, the wizard of Menlo Park replies that genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. In 87, Edison moves his laboratory from Menlo Park to West Orange, New Jersey. Here he attempts to do for the eye what the phonograph did for the ear. Edward Mybridge had recently demonstrated that a series of still photographs spinning in motion give the illusion of movement. In 89, Edison uses George Eastman's new celluloid film, projects a series of photographs on a screen, and in so doing, invents the motion picture. George Eastman calls his new camera Kodak. Instead of cumbersome glass plates, it uses roll-type film. After clicking off 100 shots, both film and camera are sent to Eastman's laboratory in Rochester, New York. After the film is developed, the camera is reloaded and returned, all for $10. This process can be standardized, mass-produced. It will soon make picture-taking a family institution. During the 80s, there are other firsts, the fountain pen. The first long-distance phone call from Boston to Providence, Rhode Island. Richard Warren Sears publishes his first catalog. The Salvation Army branches from England to America. In 81, the American Red Cross is founded by Clara Barton. Its first big test comes eight years later. When a fragile earth dam collapses, a wall of water in some places seven stories high smashes through Johnstown, Pennsylvania, killing over 2,000 people in a matter of minutes. The Johnstown flood is one of the great disasters in American history. 
claiming that the Red Cross is always the last to leave, Clara stays five months, winning the gratitude of the townspeople and the respect of the entire nation. Also during the 80s, trains and streetcars are, for the first time, powered by electricity. Electricity is stronger than horses and more versatile than cables. Before long, the clanging bells of trolley cars will be heard far beyond city limits. However, over dirt roads, and most roads are dirt, nearly all vehicles are horse-drawn. One exception is the bicycle, and the new low-wheeled safety bike brings riding down to earth making it popular to millions. At one time, canals were hailed as the answer to America's transportation problems, but most were financial failures. The Erie Canal, however, is so successful, it eliminates tolls in 1882. In the 80s, railroads are by far the chief means of transportation. They have replaced steamboat passenger service and are majestically moving into their golden age. Sixty years will go by before automobiles and airplanes challenge railroad supremacy. The architecture of this era varies greatly, but above everything else, it reflects the full bloom of the Victorian age that period of history named after England's Queen Victoria. If their houses are over-decorated, then the people who live inside them are certainly overdressed. Modesty rises to a fine art, or cult. Bodies are clothed from head to foot, and young people are watched by ever-present chaperones. Small boys are dressed in little Lord Fauntleroy outfits, complete with ruffles and dangling love locks. Fashionable women are tied tight about the waist with corsets and pushed out the back with bustles. Later on, the 80s look begins to take on straighter lines, but could still be summarized by the motto, more is better. That motto would not apply to education. The majority of schoolhouses are one or two rooms, and one or two schoolmasters teach all grades. In rural areas, classes are held for about five months each year, six days a week, 10 hours a day. Only a handful of students graduate and go on to college, to colleges that are not coeducational. If a teacher performs all duties faithfully for five years, this includes washing windows, cleaning chimneys, and checking outhouses. For men, it means not rolling up their sleeves or going to a barber shop. For women, it means not getting married or letting their bustle extend more than 10 inches. Then, after five years, they will be given a pay raise of 25 cents per week, providing, that is, the Board of Education approves. In the medical profession, doctors are not well educated, nor are they well paid. Medical students, if they can afford it, attend colleges in Europe. Specialists are rare, and most family doctors learn their trade through on-the-job training with older family doctors. On the frontier, doctors often run the local drugstore, Their hottest selling items are patent medicines, 
advertised to positively cure everything from hiccups to hysteria. Whatever they claim to cure, most remedies bring the illusion of well-being since they are heavily laced with alcohol. Even though the plains are becoming settled, the West still has pockets of lawlessness, especially in the mining boom towns of the Southwest. Tombstone, Arizona Territory, October 1881. After a year of feuding, the Clanton and McClory brothers square off against Sheriff Wyatt Earp, his two brothers, and Doc Holliday. In less than one minute, the gunfight at the OK Corral leaves three wounded and three dead. Earlier that year, in the territory of New Mexico, 21-year-old Billy the Kid is gunned down by Marshal Pat Garrett. A year later, Missouri's famous outlaw, Jesse James, is shot in the back of the head while straightening a picture in his St. Joseph home. Killed by gang member Bob Ford for the reward money, James' death marks the beginning of the end for the romanticized period of the outlaw. By the late 1880s, men who could rob a bank or train and stay alive long enough to brag about it were becoming as rare as the buffalo. In large towns and cities, people claim there are outlaws wearing business suits. Instead of toting six guns, they carry checkbooks, contracts, and mortgages. To fight back, working classes form unions. In 1886, a nationwide strike for an eight-hour day climaxes at Haymarket Square in Chicago. Strikers and police clash. A bomb is thrown. Seventeen people die. Nearly 50 are wounded. Later that year, Samuel Gompers starts the American Federation of Labor. The Department of Agriculture is agitated into existence as farmers fight railroads, bankers, and the federal government. With crop prices falling and interest rates rising, farmers join the National Grange, an organization destined to become a powerful political force in the 1890s. New Year's Day, 1890. An editorial in the New York Tribune states, Rarely does a year begin with fairer promise of beneficence in all that concerns the national well-being. Although there is separation by geography and enterprise, the nation as a whole is coming together. As the South recovers from the straitjacket of Reconstruction, the industrialized Northeast becomes more industrialized. In California, irrigation is transforming desert wasteland into an agricultural bonanza. Between 1880 and 1890, California doubles its population. During this same 10-year period, four states join the Union, and the United States increases its population by 13 million for a total of 63 million. Of these 63 million, nearly 50% now live in cities. In 1890, the Census Bureau officially declares that the frontier is closed. And that seemingly endless land, always west, is there no more. 